Well, it's been about 15 years since I got my first smartphone. I remember one of the first things I did was uh, zoom in, use the satellite map, zoom all the way in, and then watch as I was walking down the sidewalk. And, and I said, <laughs> my God, this is the 21st century. This thing knows to where I am to within a foot or two. This is absolutely amazing. And most of the advances that we've seen in our lifetime have been electronic advances. But sometimes the world of mechanics gets back in the picture, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott. And I want to show you a little video of a brand new manufacturing technique called EDM. It stands for Electrical Discharge Machinery, Machining. rather. Look at these pieces fit together. There is no detectable seam. I looked at this, and I said man this is 21st century technology this is unbelievable this kind of manufacturing is going to change the world now today's right angle has nothing to do with edm uh, today's right <laughs> angle has to do with uh, has to do with manufacturing uh, we received news just a few days ago that the um, that the one of the most technically savvy co companies in the world boeing which is just a giant when it comes to aerospace and so on has delayed the launch of their uh, space capsule the Dreamliner indefinitely, the Starliner, and it's I because think. they had a. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry. Dreamliner is the uh, is there a seven eighty seven? Thank you. The Starliner uh, has been delayed indefinitely, and I thought, wow, is it because they're having a problem with their EDM tooling, or they're not <laughs> getting those parts to fit to that level of precision? It turns out, no. The reason that it's been um, that the space vehicle has been delayed indefinitely is because that when they wired it, the electrical tape they used turned out to be flammable. And as Scott pointed out in our pre-game show, which is available only to members, um, when you send out, you know, your unpaid intern to get electrical tape uh, to build your spaceship with, you might want to specify non-flammable electrical tape. How serious is this problem? Well, it turns out that uh, it affects just about all of the electrical systems. The latest I'd heard is that the capsule will have to be disassembled hmm. and completely rewired because they hadn't gotten the um, uh, non-flammable part down. Now, Steve, of course, this is this kind of thing's a, 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 an understandable mistake, right? It's not like there was some <laughs> kind of giant. It's not like there was some kind of giant tragedy where faulty electronics or yeah. something caused a fire that killed people. That would be an example that you would take with you, presumably, for the rest of history. You would re recognize, my God, you know, the, our our carelessness with electronics nearly got three people killed. Uh, but, you know, since this kind of thing's never happened before, I'm being hyperbolic, obviously, the Apollo 1 fire was precisely this, this kind of problem. Uh, so Apollo 1 is within living memory, Steve. And here's this company that's taken billions of dollars of taxpayer money to build an obsolete capsule. And that obsolete capsule has now been delayed indefinitely because it has to be rewired because the uh, wiring uh, components that they use turns out will catch fire under certain circumstances. Yeah. We've got our top men on this problem. Top men. Top Who get men. paid cost plus, so what the hell. Um, yeah. yeah, what yeah. the hell. Yeah, Boeing, Boeing's in no rush. Uh, the thing to remember about Boeing is they were once a great engineering company based in Seattle. Then they were a crappy defense contractor whose headquarters was in Chicago. And now they're a lobbying firm based outside of D.C. Uh, who occasionally builds something that flies. Uh, this has been one of the saddest progressions in, in corporate or engineering Heart history breaking. that uh, I... I, I can think of off the top of my head. And the thing is, we I, we probably talked about this before. In 2016, uh, I believe that was years or seven years ago, SpaceX showed that you could reuse a rocket. And not only could you reuse a rocket, but you could do it at a price lower than the competition's launch price per mass to orbit. And you could do it as a, at a profit your own self. Um, it was at this point that everybody, NASA, Boeing, Ariane, uh, the ESA, uh, uh, the Japan Space Agency, everybody in the world should have looked at their existing blueprint, should have looked at their existing roadmap and said, well, that was nice, and thrown them in the trash. Because exactly right. every, We're, everything changed. That's it. Everything changed. Boeing does not have, because they, they, they don't have to have, uh, they don't have the the reusable rocket mindset. We we ran into this problem. Where, well, <laughs> we we may have yet to really run into this problem with SLS, which costs four billion to fly, and features the 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 absolute genius 
uh, feature of turning reusable space shuttle engines and making them disposable. Um, yep. Uh, there are, uh, I can't remember which part of the SLS system this is, but it has a battery with a limited shelf life. And every time they have a flight delay, uh, it becomes closer to the time that this battery has to be swapped out which, because this rocket wasn't designed to be reusable and easily serviced, means pulling the whole thing back into the, uh, into the big building and a big engineering process of disassembly and reassembly and all the rest. And now we're... Was it, was it you who told me that they have to take components from the first Orion spacecraft in order to make the second oh, Orion spacecraft? Uh, oh, yeah. I can't remember what the parts are because I we did this right angle uh, months and months ago, and I, I, yeah, I yeah, have the yeah. details on my notepad here. I, I don't have them in front of me now, but yes. It's probably the turbo and cabulator. They have problems with that system. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch that video when we're done here just, just for brain bleach with all the Boeing trouble. So, yeah, now we're finding the, the same sort of situation with Starliner, and I believe Starliner is supposed to be reusable is that correct who knows right it, who uh, cares it, like sls who knows if it'll ever fly again or it, well yeah they had an unmanned test flight last year um the reusable Which mindset failed. isn't there so if there's an issue they can't swap out an engine they can't swap out a part the way the way spacex and its tiny uh, uh startups can they got to take the whole damn thing apart and for it to be something so simple, so basic, Bill. Boeing has to be allowed to fail. They have, that company has to go bankrupt and its assets and its engineers who must just hang their heads in shame at this stuff. They still have some of yep. the best engineers in the world. Yep. But that company has to fail and fail so big that the, the, its assets and its people go to places that can actually run a damn rocket company. Uh, Scott, uh, now obviously uh, the the problem with the Starliner wasn't just um, uh, electrical tape. There's another cutting edge technological uh, system that that apparently was uh, likely to fail on the Starliner, uh, and that was the parachutes. Now, we've only had parachutes since '83. Uh, um, so it does take a while to work the bugs out of this uh, this design. And when I say we've had parachutes since 83, I don't mean 1983. No. And I don't mean 1883. I mean 1783 was the first successful parachute uh, uh, recovery of a human, I think. And so you have to ask yourself, if Boeing can't get the parachutes right, and apparently, unlike Apollo, uh, I believe that a... It's multiple parachutes, and I think in one of if one of those chutes fails, then that is lethal to the crew. I seem to recall there was one Apollo mission. I don't remember which one, but I seem to remember one of the three parachutes was partially opened, and they hit pretty hard, but it was survivable. So electrical tape, Scott, and parachutes. Uh, our 21st century manufacturing genius uh, and, and the billions and billions of dollars that we spend on Boeing to lead the way into the space age... Uh, they're solving just the toughest problems like a bunch of murdering thieves. You know, I think if I were on the board at Boeing, I would make a motion that we, um, we decide to outsource manufacturing of any kind of aircraft uh, to somebody else who, who really knows how to do it and wants to do it and can keep it simple. Um, instead of adding increasing layers of complexity uh, more and more to try to look impressive. Um, and, you know, I was just thinking while, while you guys were talking, I was like, you know, all before SpaceX, uh, all the stuff that we launched into space is either now uh, stranded in low Earth orbit forever, uh, sitting at the bottom of the ocean, sitting on the surface of the moon, burned up on re-entry, um, and, and maybe I'm leaving something out, but what it isn't, it's, it's not in the hangar being power washed, ready for refueling. And that is the, the key difference. I've, I told you before, I've watched as many of these SpaceX launches as I can. And I'm getting to the point where I can almost call out the things before they happen. You know, it's like, well, in 10 seconds from now, we'll be having main engine cut off. And, you know, it's like, like they, it, they're so predictable. And I watched the reentry of the capsule that just went up to ISS and, and the astronauts who hung up 
hung around up there for about nine days and then came back to Earth. And they had those parachutes. And, you know, here come the drogue chutes. The drogue chutes are going to be coming out in 12 seconds. And then psh, you see the drogue chutes. And it's a night vision camera showing us all this. And then the, the main blooms of the parachutes come out and it lands as predictable. And there's a boat just waiting there, just out of range of the splash, basically, that pulls up. And then this crane comes off the back of the boat and it lifts up the capsule and it sets it down on this pad. And then this pad glides forward on the boat. And these people, I mean, it's just like clockwork. And, and there, you know, everything has been thought out and kept as simple as possible. And at the end of every uh, satellite launch, the, the Starlink launches, they always go, well, the booster that just landed on that uh, floating dock out in the middle of the ocean has just uh, come back to Earth. It completed its ninth mission. The the two ferry yep. halves that deployed, yep, yep, yep. Um, those were six times each and, you know, whatever. Like, they keep track of all this equipment that they're using. And it's just something we never thought of when we were thinking about the space age that Elon Musk's ingenious notion is let's reuse this stuff <laughs> you know like we just kind of didn't deal with that in our whole dreams about our space age future but he was thinking no the way to make this work is to reduce the cost and to reduce the cost you need to be able to reuse and they shouldn't let another penny of government money flow to an organization like Boeing after a mistake like this is simply inexcusable after all the years of making aircraft that they should have two ridiculous mistakes like that. Um, I first heard the story last night during um, Stratosphere Studios, the live show we do, one of two we do a week. And um, somebody pointed out to me that uh, that uh, SpaceX was saying, yeah, this is a slow week. We're only, we've only got one launch this week. Yeah. This week. <laughs> only one. Um, normally there are two or three launches a week. Um, they're on pace to do 100 launches a year. So they're, they're, that's a paradigm change. It's, as Steve said, once once you see that, uh, it's time just – we can either continue to fall further behind or we can try to catch these guys because this is the future. Um, see, here's what's interesting to me about Boeing. Boeing, as it exists now, the super conglomerate, Boeing, Lockheed, Grumman, Northrop, you know, McDonald <laughs> thing – when we were making genuine progress in aviation, all of those were separate companies. Um, McDonnell Douglas used to be just Douglas. Yeah. Lockheed Boeing used to be Lockheed and Boeing and North American and Grumman and 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 General Dynamics and all of these guys were were competing with each other and they and so they had to stay on the ball. And as these companies merged and merged and merged, the the competition went down to two companies. And since they're both essentially living on government contracts, they're not even really in direct competition with each other anymore. Not, e even things like the fly off between the F-22 and the F-23, that was 20 years ago. That's the last time I remember two aerospace companies being in competition for, for money. And what, what I think is most interesting about this, folks, is that I think this is actually an interesting analogy for the actual country, for America. The country has gotten too complex. It's too big. The, let me rephrase that. The government. The government yeah. is too big. When something hits a certain amount of size, it becomes unmanageable, unsteerable, fossilized, uh, unresponsive. Nobody is responsible for anything. No one has accountability. The, you, the, these companies and the federal government are, are kind of like what happens when you live in a city. You have muggings and stuff in a city because somebody can steal your money, disappear into the subways, and you'll never see them again. And when you have a company this big, where a, where $4,000 4, million of taxpayer money is, oh yeah, I don't know what happened to that. I guess we just, I got, but check behind the, the, the cushions on the couch, right? That's too big. And what we need to do to solve the problem of, of Boeing is we need to break Look, I'm not saying we need to break Boeing up, I'm not going that far, but Boeing would be best served by breaking itself up into lots and lots of little pieces, yeah. and so would our federal government, which is how the system was designed. The states were supposed to retain enough power to prevent this kind of ossified, uh, dinosaur, centralized incompetence and disregard. It's not just incompetence. It's complacency and it and it's criminal negligence. It's just being so sure that the money train is going to keep coming that you just you're not even resting on your laurels anymore. You haven't unpacked your laurels in 25 years. They're they're sitting in the closet and they're all mothballed and and all the rest of it. So um, SpaceX, by the way, which is now doing 
miracles unless Elon has the kind of vision that I have not seen of any kind ever will eventually go this way too. SpaceX will corner the market, SpaceX will get bigger and bigger, and then as they get bigger and bigger, they'll get slower and, and heavier and stupider and, and more and more complacent, and then some young company will come along and eat their lunch, and that's how that's how things work. But the thing I would just close with is, is something that my friend Bert Rutan has said many times. Bert Rutan, for those of you not uh, up on recent history, not only flew the first commercial flight into space with a commercial astronaut, privately owned astronaut, he built his own space program. He didn't just build the, the, the space vehicle. He had to build the launch vehicle for the space vehicle. He had to build the, the, the ground control systems. He just did it. And he got, one of the reasons he did it was because um, he got, um, oh my gosh, what's his last name? Paul um, from Microsoft. Paul Allen. Died not too Allen. Thank you. Paul. Paul Allen wrote him a check for, I think, somewhere in the ballpark of $12 million because there was a prize. If you can do two suborbital flights within a two-week period with the same vehicle, you win $10 million. He said, Bert said that the power of prize money is unbelievable in terms of the gravitational pull that it has in yeah. terms of other capital. You offer a prize to be the first person to do this or the first person to do that, then young small startup companies can then go get the financial resources they need, tell them we're going to win this prize. It gives the investor a chance to think, well, maybe I'll get some of my money back. And, and it's a miracle what this thing does. When I think about $4,000 million spent on this dinosaur, what what those four thousand million dollars could have done if you distributed them among a hundred different companies that were all trying to get there that's the way the future should work and paul allen to his undying credit this just needs to be said i know i'm running along here when when spaceship one had completed the second of the two missions and won the prize i think there was one more flight left to go or something along those lines and and Paul said, Bert, you don't have to fly this flight. I don't need the $10 million. That vehicle belongs in the Smithsonian. I don't want to risk anything happening to it. You know, I mean, it, it, we, you, you did what you had. Actually, I think it was, they did the, they needed one more flight to get the, the, the prize. And, and, and Paul said, let's not risk the vehicle. And Bert said, we told you we're going to go get the X prize and we're going to, so that's what they did. Um, so there you go, folks. It's not hard to understand if, if the, if the one of the largest if the largest aerospace company in the world can no longer produce aerospace material or aerospace vehicles because they can't get the wiring tape right or the parachutes correct then it is definitely time to leave that company alone and start finding those little garages that have people in them who are going to clean Boeing's clock and they're going to do it just the way that SpaceX has done it. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time right here on Right Angle.